note, may I have your attention, please? Welcome. My name is Larry Rosenthal. I'm the chair of the Berkeley Center for Right Wing Studies. And thank you all for being here. Um, I have a, uh, a couple of announcements before we begin. Um, one of them is a, a robust thank you to our co-sponsor, which is the Felton E. Henderson Center for Social Justice. Um, and uh, I would also like to take this opportunity to tell you about our next event, which is Ruth Brownstein, Assistant Professor of Sociology at the University of Connecticut will present a talk entitled Prophets and Patriots, Faith in Democracy Across the Political Divide. That talk will be on Thursday, November 16th. That's a week from today from 4 to 5.30 in the Vildovsky Room at the Institute for the Study of Societal Issues, which is located at 2538 Channing Way. Please turn off your cell phones if you haven't done so already. Um, also, uh, uh, there's being passed around a, um, a sign-up sheet, and we would be grateful if everybody signed up. The way today's event will work is that Professor Kramer will speak Hi. Pardon me? To turn this thing off. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, it's um, you know, it's opposite day, I suppose. Um, and um, what we're going to do is have Professor Kramer speak for about forty minutes, and then we'll have Professor Hochschild speak uh, for give ten minutes of remarks, and then we will open up the discussion and invite questions from the audience. Today is a particular day, it seems to me. Today is the first anniversary of the day after. And it's a strange day after. It, it seems to have lingered for an entire year. And people ask themselves, how did this happen? How did this other world of America first nationalism, ethnic nationalism, and kind of acid populism not only rise up like a political ambush, but manage to win a national election. Both of our scholars today have contributed crucial books to help us with our hangover. It's a great pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Catherine Kramer is professor, uh, is director of the Moorgridge Center for Public Service and a professor in the Department of Political Science at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Her award-winning book, The Politics of Resentment, Rural Consciousness in Wisconsin and the Rise of Scott Walker, examines rural resentment towards cities and its implications for contemporary politics. Professor Kramer is also the author of Talking About Race, Community Dialogues, and the Politics of Difference, and Talking About Politics, Informal Groups and Social Identity in American Life. Her work has appeared in many venues, including the Washington Post, the New York Times, Vox.com, USA Today, and The Guardian. Our respondent today is Arlie Russell Hochschild, who is Professor Emerita of Sociology at UC Berkeley, and a dear friend of the center, I might add. Her latest book, Strangers in Their Own Land, is a New York Times bestseller and a finalist for the National Book Award. She's the author of several other groundbreaking studies, including The Second Shift, Time Bend, The Managed Heart, and The Outsourced Self. And with that, please join me in welcoming Professors Kramer and Hochschild. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And is it okay if I pull out the microphone? And is it okay, or should I just leave? I don't want to mess up anything. All right. 
All right, all right. Great. Well, it is a real honor to be here. Thank you to Christine Trost and Larry Rosenthal for inviting me, and to Cynthia Alvarez and Harpreet um, for the arrangements for making it possible for me to be here. Uh, it's, it's always a pleasure to be in California, especially as the weather gets colder in Wisconsin. It's always a treat to come to Berkeley where there's so many fabulous people doing fascinating things. And as you can imagine, it is a real treat for me to be here sharing this time with Arlie. So this is just uh, kind of a moment of a lifetime. So thank you. Um, I'm going to start by saying that the word populism or populist in my title is a little bit of a distraction because I haven't really spent my career studying populists. As I'll explain in a little bit, I, uh, in the last decade, I ended up studying people who we now call populists. But the thing that has driven me, or the thing that I've really been fascinated with throughout my career, is how people understand politics, how they interpret the world, and how that matters for the way that they interpret politics, and what that means for democracy, what it means for the health of our democracy. So in the past year, though, um, I have been in more conversations about populism. And people have turned to me to say, will you come to such and such a conference? Will you come and give a talk on this panel about populism? And so I want to start off by talking briefly about that literature, because it helps understand the motivation for the rest of my remarks today. Basically, in, in the study of populism today, typically when we talk about a populist, we're talking about a politician. But in my title, I'm using the term populist to refer to the people who are voting for those folks we call populists, which are, in general, political entrepreneurs, I like to say, who are pitching themselves as an outsider who's going against a corrupt and evil elite, corrupt and evil government, and they're casting themselves as sort of the heroes of the people, a particular construction of the people, but the people who are the bastion of the good. And so that's the way, when I talk about populism, that's what I'm referring to as kind of a, a person who votes for or supports one of these uh, political entrepreneurs who is basically going uh, through, in, uh, through a political strategy or using a style of political rhetoric that says government, elites, bad, people, particular, conception of the people, good. So that's where I'm coming from. In the conversations about populism since the 2016 presidential election, I think that there's been a turning towards a recognition that we should pause and think about what populism is teaching us about democracy. Because in Poland, as Ali and I were just saying, Poland and Hungary and the UK and France and Germany and Austria and Australia, we're experiencing similar things. Not always the same, but the, a similar thing. And it is reason to stop and think, what is this telling us about democracy? Usually when we're asking that, what we're asking is, how do people who support these candidates or these populist parties, how do they think about elites and how do they think about government? And I want to turn your attention to something different for the, the remainder of my remarks, and that is, how are these folks we're calling populist or populist supporters, how do they think about their opponents? Meaning, if we are truly in a democracy, part of what we're doing is making decisions that affect each other. We're making decisions about governing each other. And so for me, it becomes really important of how we think about each other, how we think about this, the democratic competence or the civic competence of each other. Do we really think that other people in the democracy are capable of doing this? Do we? And if we don't, why don't we? So what I want to draw your attention to is how are these folks um, that we are calling populists, and let's just be more blunt here, the folks that voted for Donald Trump, how do they think about, and I, I don't think I'm stretching it too far here, how do they think about us? Or how do they think about folks who voted for Hillary Clinton, people who vote Democratic, candidates, people who are left-leaning. And I'm not going to assume that everybody in here supported Hillary Clinton. But in general, I feel that on my campus, 
I feel it at Berkeley that we are sort of <laughs> seen often as the target of uh, Trump supporters, right? So that's what I'm talking about. Okay, so step back about a decade, and I had just earned tenure at the University of Wisconsin. And I, at the time, was really interested in how social class identity matters for the way people interpret politics. It's a long story how I got there, but I was really interested in trying to find, um, I wanted to invite myself into conversations of people, everyday people, and listen to the way they talked about politics and pay really close attention to how social class identity was mattering. So you can probably tell from my accent, I'm from Wisconsin. I'm proud of that. It's probably why it comes through my accent, but I've lived there most of my life. And um, if you don't know, Wisconsin is here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we're in flyover land. And so what I did was to take my home state and to carve it up into different regions and then in these different regions, sample communities. And I can tell you more about how I did that if you're interested. But there were 27 communities in all that I sampled. And there were cities and suburbs and small towns. And this is just generally where they were located. I try to save the, you know, uh, save the identity of the places that I visited. And what I was trying to do was get a wide range of places because I wanted to invite myself into the conversations of folks in these communities and pay attention to social class. And I thought, if I sample a wide range of places, more likely than not, the conversations that I find and invite myself into are going to vary relatively widely with respect to people's social class identity. So what I did once I sent one of these communities was to call up a local informant, sometimes a local newspaper editor, sometimes someone who worked in our uh, large university extension service, and I'd say, we are the <laughs> Sorry. If that was me. <laughs> I'm going to try to keep my electronics separate. We are the Do you want me to do that? No. No. We're, maybe, yeah, okay. We're in, we're in such and such Wisconsin, can I go, that um, I can hear people talking with one another, not necessarily about politics, but um, I'll even unplug the USB here, um, but about, you know, just sharing their lives with one another. And, okay, I don't know if that has anything to do with it, but. No, I can just use the keyboard. It's no big deal. That just allows me to roam. Thank you, though. They sent me to places like this. Diners, gas stations. In a lot of the smaller communities, gas stations are where people go to visit with one another and share the local news. So a lot of times what they're sending me to are early morning coffee clutches of people on their way to work or retirees getting out of the house in the morning. And um, I, so I had sampled those 27 communities, and, and I should say, I'm starting this project again a little over a decade ago in 2007. And after about a year of doing this, of showing up in these gas stations and such and saying, hi, I'm Kathy from Madison. Do you mind if I join you this morning? And, you know, here's my card. Here's a token of my appreciation. Okay with you if I turn on my recorder. What are your concerns? Tell me, what are you all talking about these days? And going back to these groups, and, and, and this, eventually there were 39 groups in all that I was spending time with. About a year in, it was undeniable that what I was hearing in the smaller communities was both really surprising to me, and I think, I thought at the time, it's really important. I'm not quite sure how <laughs> yet, but it's really important. And what I heard, I eventually wrote up into this book that Larry mentioned, The Politics of Resentment. So given the title, you can see where this is going. What I heard was people saying to me, we are not getting our fair share in this town, in places like this. So people in the smaller communities were saying to me, we're not getting our fair share of attention, of political power, um, of resources or of respect. With a little bit more detail, it sounded like this. We are, you know, politicians don't come out here. They don't come and ask us what we think or what are our concerns and what have you all been talking about. The 
money doesn't come here. Taxpayer dollars are sucked in by Madison and spent on itself or in Milwaukee. We don't see it in return. And all the wealth is in the cities and um, all the good jobs are in the cities. And um, the people making the decisions, both in government, but in other industries, in the healthcare, in the corporate sector, what have you, they don't know us. They don't understand us. They've never spent time in a place like this. And they don't actually even like us. They think we're uneducated and unsophisticated <laughs> and sexist and racist and homophobic and Islamophobic. And I put up this map here just to point, just to explain this concept a little bit more. So Madison is the state capital and where the university, the flagship university is located. And then Milwaukee's over here. And Milwaukee is the main industrial center. And so these two cities are the metropolitan areas in the state. And Chicago's down here. And the Twin Cities are up there by St. Croix Falls, actually um, just uh, out the highway from Eau Claire. And these other cities on the map range from pretty small places to medium-sized cities. It's really Madison and Milwaukee that's the very urban part of the state. And the rest of the state is pretty rural. And there's a lot of it, right? And so people were perceiving everything happens down there. And the rest of you don't pay attention to us. And we deserve more. We deserve more of that attention and resources and respect. So this is when rural consciousness, the subtitle in my book, what that's referring to is both this identity as someone from a, a small place, combined with a sense of not getting their fair share of injustice with respect to resources and attention and respect, and then specifically about these three things, about power and resources and respect. And that's what I mean when I refer to resentment in my title. And it's powerful because there's so many aspects to it, right? It's this resentment towards cities and city people, but it's also resentment towards elites in general, very, sometimes very vague references to elites, sometimes more specific. It's also resentment towards a particular political party, which is more and more associated with cities. And obviously, it's resentment towards racial minorities. In Wisconsin, in particular, we're a very, very racially segregated state. There are 12 Native nations in the state, um, and they're located in predominantly rural areas. So I don't want to dismiss that, but our African American population and Latino population is quite segregated in the in the rural areas. But I can, I mean, urban areas. I can tell you more about that later on. You all, I'm sure, as I'm explaining this, I can see it in your eyes and in some of your facial expressions. Some of you are thinking, they don't know what they're talking about. Because if anything, rural areas are get their get more than their fair share of resources. Or don't they realize farm subsidies, for example, or don't they realize how much disproportionate political power rural areas have these days? Well, those critiques, I'm sorry to say it, <laughs> you hear reflected back in their comments about left-leaning folks, about folks who voted for Hillary Clinton or support the Democratic Party. And that's what I'm going to dwell on for a little bit here. So take a deep breath <laughs> for those of you who find yourself um, critiquing the, the Trump supporters. Here we go. So. One thing that comes up often, and I should say, so my field work was from 2007 to 2012. And when my book came out in 2016, and shortly before my book came out, I started to go back around to most of these groups to check in with them, but also to give them a copy of my book. And then, obviously, I was really interested in what they were saying about the 2016 race. And so, most of what I'm going to share with you are comments that I have heard um, in 2016 and 2017. One thing I've heard a lot of is, you know, we can't have conversation with the Democrats in our lives because they just shout us down. Here's one example from a gentleman who's saying, you know, yeah, that's the thing we've noticed. This is from a group of folks um, that meet in a, a service station, an actual, uh, not anymore a service station, in a warehouse because the service station went out of business. 
and we meet every morning, and he's telling me, you know, that's what we noticed, that you get a Republican and a Democrat talking, and just, just talking about it, politics or the election. The Democrat seems like they just go ballistic, over the top. Doesn't matter what you say, they're just totally, you're just totally wrong. They won't even allow themselves to listen to what you have to say. So, when we start thinking about the perceptions among these populists or Trump supporters about the civic competence of people on the other side of politics, one aspect in which uh, they, they see reason to not be, to not think uh, others are competent is intolerance. Another is in a wide range of ways saying things like Democrats or people who voted for Clinton don't know what they're doing. They're ignorant. They're being fooled, um, and uh, so I'll walk you through some of that. One thing is the uh, comments that come up about how people are going to vote for a Democrat regardless of who it is. So this guy is telling me, I know this guy who told me that, you know, if it was Hitler that was the candidate, he would have voted for him if Hitler had run as a Democrat. Another, there's a, just a general theme of, you know, they're ignorant. They don't know what they're doing. They, they don't know the facts. Sounds like a lot of the critiques of Trump voters, right? One thing that comes up often is kind of going off the, this last comment I just showed to you is a sense of Democrats vote for people on the basis of what we're calling these days. I, don't, I mean, I, I know it's not a new term. We'll come back to that later. But identity politics. That, you know, people voted for Barack Obama because he's black. Or people voted for Barack Obama because he's African American. Or people voted for Hillary Clinton because she's a woman. And that's the only reason. That's a critique they're lobbying back. Another thing that comes up is this uh, sense that Democrats are hypocritical. And it comes up most strongly when we get around to talking about Trump and women. And some of the comments and things that were revealed during the election about Trump's interactions with women. And here's one example I want to share with you along those lines. Um, I, okay, what's the short story here? I spent time with a group of women in a, um, a small, uh, a very low income county, uh, a town in that county it would, that is in central west Wisconsin, and they meet for lunch once a week on Tuesdays. And they're very, very conservative, and they know each other through their church. And after the election, um, for the first time, a, a younger woman about my age, that's funny, relatively younger, about my age, <laughs> was in the group, came, with, came to lunch with us. and. She's letting me have it a little bit. She says, I have a question for you. We've been talking maybe about an hour at this time. I have a question for you to be personal. Were you for Trump or were you for Hillary? And I said, oh, well, I voted for Hillary, to be honest. Well, why, she says. Well, uh, and here, this hardly ever happens to me. It's very rare in this work that people say, so what do you think or who did you vote for? It's happened more and more since the election which is telling, right? Um, so I'm kind of struggling here because usually what I try to do is skirt the question and turn it back to them because it shouldn't be about my views, right? So I'm struggling here and I say, uh, 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 I'm, uh, because um, Hillary, I have to say, pause, pause, pause. Well, I did watch that videotape that was released, you know, with Trump bragging about grabbing this woman and I really, pause, 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 um, um, I just couldn't get past that. I have a nine-year-old daughter, and, but look at Slick Willie, this other woman says, Bill Clinton, right? His, and another, Carrie, the, uh, Carrie, this young woman says, uh, his choice of words were inappropriate, but we're all human. I mean, even the girls go out and get drunk and have a good time and say things maybe we shouldn't say in politics. And Gertie says, well, Bill Clinton, just look at him. And Carrie says, they didn't know that they were being taped. Again, something that happened in 2003 is going to come out now, yet look at all the stuff Hillary's done. That just goes underneath the carpet, which is a lot more harmful than what Trump ever said, not that it wasn't appropriate. And so in that way, when I'm talking about people making these criticisms of 
Clinton supporters being hypocritical, that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. Like, well, what about them? What about the stuff that they're letting slide with their candidate? Another thing that comes up in terms of these criticisms of being ignorant or being fooled is uh, this idea that people vote for Democrats because of handouts, because they don't want to bite the hand that feeds them, as this person is saying here. You know, this, this guy, um, uh, uh, early morning, another early morning coffee group, and he's saying there's too many people on the government team now, which is really sc which has screwed up the voter base. They expect all the working people, interesting, to pay for all these people that don't work, and that's basically the Democratic voter base is all these giveaway programs and all these aid programs. That's why it's hard for conservatives like most of us here to break through because they're all all the devils are voting Democratic because they don't want to bite the hand that's feeding them. These sentiments about handouts um, and working hard and initiative are typically where I can, where one, can, me included, can see the work of racism the most because um, in people's, uh, when people are telling me, you know, we're not getting our fair share and that we deserve more, another part of that narrative is we deserve more, and it seems to us that what we deserve is going to people who don't deserve it. And in those allegations are conceptions of who works hard in the population. So these notions of deservingness are tied really closely to people's assessments of who works hard and not. And as we all know, I mean, it's one of the really unfortunate things in uh, are in the U.S. society that our perceptions of who works hard are very racialized. And so it tends to be the case that white folks are seen as more hardworking than people of color. And so when people are thinking about who's deserving in the population, some of the ways in which racism enters into those conversations is, well, of course, they're not deserving because they're not working hard, or they're the recipient of a government benefit um, because they're lazy, for example. I want to share with you briefly a conversation um, about how, the, how this has sounded in 2016, 2017, because I've had many um, opportunities to listen to people talk about Black Lives Matter. And we were having that uh, conversation about that one morning, and this fellow is saying to me, he's intertwining a lot of different things here, both his, his thoughts about the economy not turning around and also about protest in general. And he's saying, you know, the, econ the reason the economy is an issue with me is because if you get the economy rolling, many of the people that are not working are going to be working. And the idleness of it all right now, I think no jobs and whatnot, I think people get disgusted. I'm talking about those people in Madis Milwaukee, Madison, Racine, and Kenosha. I'm not talking about rural America so much as I'm talking about the riots. And when he's talking about the people in Milwaukee, Madison, Racine, and Kenosha, I am pretty sure what he's referring to here are racial minorities, in particular African Americans involved in Black Lives Matters protests. I draw your attention to that because what I want to share with you are these criticisms of the competence, the civic competence of folks who voted for Clinton in terms of their, the quality of their reasoning, the quality of their votes, but now I want to draw your attention to their thoughts about the tactics of people on the left, in particular protest, because this, um, the, the thoughts about personal initiative are really important, I think. So in the previous slide, I was showing you this quote in which this person was um, criticizing people for in the realm of employment not having enough initiative and yet criticizing people for participating in riots or protests. And protest behavior is a form of political action that takes a lot of initiative, right? And so to notice how there's allegations of uh, improper personal initiative in one realm of our life in employment and then um, improper in a different realm, in the political realm, uh, is important, I think. So here's some examples of what this criticism of their tactics look like. So um, Black Lives Matter, people often criticize, you know, um, what's the point? What are they going to accomplish? It's disruptive. That 
along those lines, but also when the Women's March met, happened um, the day after the inauguration, people had a lot to say about that too. So for example, things like, what do these women expect out of this protest? What do they expect? One man asked me, he, he, he started to say that, he looked at me and maybe I had a certain expression on my face and, he's, and he, he asked me, well maybe you think it's gonna do something, you know, and he paused and he said, maybe they were there. <laughs> <laughs> and then I said, no, actually I was in Alabama. And, and he said, oh. And what I didn't explain, which should be very genuine, I should have, was to say, yeah, I was in Alabama because I took my nine-year-old daughter to see a variety of civil rights memorials and landmarks. And that's how I chose to spend Inauguration Weekend. But we didn't get into that. Maybe next time. Here's another example. Um, not just African Americans, not just women, but young people too. Like, where are they getting all this time to participate in these protests? A sense of, you know, if they had a real job, if they were working really hard, they wouldn't have the time to take part in these protests. Okay. So, since the 2016 presidential election, my life has changed a whole lot. I thought I was writing about a particular corner of the world that I cared a whole lot about. And it turns out that what I was seeing in Wisconsin has a lot um, to teach us about what's going on in the rest of the US and perhaps around the world. And because of that, I've received a lot of correspondence from people I've never met, mainly through email, but some through phone calls, some through surface mail letters. And I've decided to analyze that carefully uh, as an excuse to pay close attention to it, because oftentimes it's just hard to keep up with email. I'm sure many of you know that feeling. But I wanted to just pay really close attention, attention to it and try to learn from it. So looking at those emails carefully, I mean, a lot of it is, you know, thank you for writing that book, and I now understand, or thank you for writing that book, I'm from Wisconsin, and always cared about this place, those kind of sentiments. But what I want to draw you to is, out of 163 emails I had my hands on, um, I should say it differently, out of 163 emails that weren't from people I knew, or weren't from academics, or weren't people who were asking me a citation for this or that claim I had made, 28 of them said to me, the problem is there's something wrong with these people. There's something wrong with these people who voted for Donald Trump. And so I'm going to use those emails to reflect back to you, reflections back on these folks whose perceptions of our competence I've just shared with you. So here are some, some of the things that we hear in return about these Trump voters. One is that, you know, they, where are they getting their information? And Fox News, Fox News, Fox News, right? Like, they're in some bubble, paying attention to a particular stream of news, and that's the problem. Another is all kinds of, you know, asking me, didn't they know that? This one is, was there not a recognition that federal dairy product price supports, crop insurance, and other price support programs helped? Sometimes, sometimes yes, but I think when I get these comments, what I sometimes write back to folks is, was there not a recognition that it's actually 2% of the people in this community who are farmers? Like, rural America does not mean farmers, right? The, the percentage of people who actually are farmers themselves is very low. If you stretch it to include everybody who has some kind of employment related to farming at all, sometimes it's 10% of these communities. So I'm doing a little bit of defensiveness here, but let me give you some other examples of things that are said. One is people um, who grew up in a rural community and have moved to a city and now, it, you know, have done this really difficult dance of straddling those lives, write to me and say things like, when, when will they get over it, right? We've all spent over half a decade listening to them, meaning in Wisconsin um, when Scott Walker was elected in 2010, just I think that's the point he's referring to. Yet we still hear the same refrain. Elites don't listen to us. What will construe being listened to? When will they feel heard? 
when we all acquiesce to their retrograde and largely false presumptions about the world they live in, honestly, win. Or here's another um, kind of typical example of people saying, you know, there's something wrong with these people, and the thing that's wrong is, you know, everybody who had it together in their communities got up and moved or went and got an education or went to where the jobs are and so that the people who are left behind are this grumpy, resentful, uneducated, hyper-conservative people. So now I'm going to conclude on, and that I've left you all probably feeling worse than you did when you walked in here. So across all these comments, what I see happening is people focusing on the flaws of each other, right? I'm, I'm focusing in on competence or assessments of competence. So, you know, it makes sense that partly what we're getting at is flaws of each other. But what I want to draw your attention to is just a very common social psychological phenomenon of what we sometimes call group attributions of responsibility, right? Where if we're talking about our group or our people and we're encountering a hardship, more often than not, we're going to attribute blame to something beyond us, right? Some external force that's making our lives hard. But when we're talking about other people, those others, and they're complaining about a hardship, we're more likely to say, yeah, if they just pulled themselves up by their bootstraps, or attributing blame to their own individual characteristics. And I think that's really a problem for democracy because to the extent that we focus on the flaws amongst each other, we are distracted from the things that are really wrong with our democracy, I think. Things like the lack of representation of the vast majority of us, right? The, the feeling of not being resented. Those three things I kept reiterating before, that feeling of I'm not getting my fair share of attention, I'm not getting my fair share of the stuff I need in order to thrive, and I'm not getting my fair share of respect. It's not just people in rural Wisconsin saying that, right? And it's not just people in rural U.S. saying that. We hear that from so many corners. So just briefly, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but my friend Larry Bartels has been doing this work on unequal responsiveness for some time now. And these charts, and, uh, I'll explain them briefly. This is from a second edition of a 2008 book. This is a 2016 edition called Unequal Democracy. And what these charts are showing you is that if you break down the population into income thirds, this is the U.S. House and that's the U.S. Senate, the way the responsiveness is strongest among, uh, to the concerns of the wealthiest third in both of these chambers, and especially so in the Senate, right? Meaning, if anyone's being listened to at all, especially when we look at the House, in our population, it's the wealthiest amongst us. And so to the extent that we are paying attention to the flaws of each other, we are distracted from paying attention to those structures and those things that are actually making life harder for all of us. So I'll end there and turn it over to Arlie, who I'm sure has something more uplifting to say. <laughs> Well, um, that was absolutely uh, fabulous, uh, Kathy. Um, I'm a, a great fan of uh, Kathy's work, and it, it's like we sort of were a team of, ho of horses, you know, field workers. Okay, you do rural, I'll do south. Who can we get for Rust Belt? <laughs> um, and um, uh, I think what's uh, really remarkable ab about um, your book and and uh, and in this presentation is that you fill in a, um, a huge blind spot um, for <coughs> uh, we coastal urbanites and um, 
you take us right to the downtown athletic club and we feel like we're kind of sitting there too. This is especially important paradoxically for progressives. You must have seen the recent Pew study that found that actually liberals um, are more insulated from people unlike themselves than uh, conservatives are. Uh, there was a Pew found that half of people that voted for uh, Hillary Clinton um, had a friend who voted for Trump. Uh, wait a minute, do I have that right? I uh, don't, wait a minute. Um, a recent Pew found that comparing Trump and Hillary voters found that liberals were more insulated. Nearly half, 47% of people planning to vote for Clinton had no close friends who supported Trump, but only a third of Trump supporters had no friends who backed Clinton. Again, nearly half of liberal Democrats said that if a friend supported Trump, uh, it would, quote, put a strain on their friendship. But only 13% of Trump supporters said the same thing for them. So it makes for, for all the degree to which uh, coastal, urban, highly educated people imagine themselves as cosmopolitan and outreaching and diversity friendly, uh, we're not particularly diversity friendly when it comes to <laughs> uh, rural residents and and Southern residents and Rust Belt residents. So um, anyway, you, you fill up blind spot, very important, very timely. And also I, I have to appreciate how you've um, kind of um, analytically acute and you, you draw us to an understanding of democracy. And I like the way you ended this, that if we're shouting at each other and criticizing each other and calling each other incompetent to vote, we're really missing the point uh, that, in fact, none of us are really represented properly. And there are real issues. So um, I guess it left me with several um, uh, questions that it would be uh, fun to discuss. Um, one is how you found race. How, how did it manifest itself? You say that you felt that um, you, you know, Madison could be a code word, sort of living in the city was kind of a code word for uh, being uh, a, a um, African American, let's say. What were the other code words? And did that ever, uh, the people I studied um, in Louisiana would always say, well, I know those liberals think that we're racist down here, but we're not. You know, Just being white, they think, makes us racist. So very defensive. Um, um, but I'm wondering how, how you, you know, found, found that. In my own experience after Charlottesville, I, I've been back to Louisiana three times since the book and ask them about that. Because how do you feel about those monuments that were being um, um, taken down? And I get a big silence about it. Well, you know, the liberals didn't used to be worried about the monuments, it's just now that they are, and why is that? And I ran by them uh, an idea that my colleague, uh, Troy Duster had <coughs> in this department. <coughs> and, and Troy suggested, well, don't take down Robert E. Lee on his horse. Put Frederick Douglass right next to him. Have two monuments that tell both sides of the history. Keep history, but just broaden the historical story that you say. So I tried that idea out on, on, on who? On um, Trump voters in um, southwest Louisiana. That was who I studied for my book. And they said, well, OK, that's interesting, sure. But then they would also say, but who's going to pay for the extra monument? <laughs> uh, you know, if they pay for it. So they didn't include themselves in, 
in the people who should pay for the extra monument. And then I have to say I heard one other thing. Well, so would Frederick Douglass be on a horse? <laughs> So I'm just wondering how, how those conversations happen for you. Just curious. Um, I also uh, would be interested in what you have to say about the role of media. Talking to people, could you tell that they had just watched Fox News that day? Yeah. I mean, and, and could you differentiate the Fox watchers from the non-Fox watchers? That would be interesting. And finally, um, in your paper, though not in your presentation, you ended a little pessimistically, I have to say. You say here um, in your paper, at a minimum, the views I've presented uh, are a caution against crafting democratic innovations that require joint buy-in from people with opposing political views. Wow. Wow. Well, okay, you know, you were right. I'm going to try and cheer you up a little. Um, I believe that there is, under the radar, a movement, um, despite our public polarization. If you were to Google something called the Bridge Alliance, Bridge Alliance, you would find an umbrella group that um, describe some 70 or 80 different organizations with names like Hi from the Other Side. <coughs> um, and uh, right here in Berkeley, uh, Joan Blades, the co-founder of MoveOn.org, uh, is a mediation lawyer and has begun um, a, a project called Living Room Conversations. There are now hundreds across uh, the country. I participated in one with one of the respondents that I write about in my book, who was our house guest. And we got a right winger and, a, and some other 10 in, in our living room. Uh, and Joan mediated it. So there, she brought to it the skills of a mediator. And Actually, we did. She began with, well, what kind of world, what kind of country do we want? You know, what are your ideals? Well, there, there was a lot of, of, uh, of agreement. And then different stories came out. It's not that just values are different, but the stories, when you see how the values are embedded in a story, it helps you get where the other person is coming from. So... Um, Van Jones, I, I think, uh, is another example. There is Bridge Berkeley, and uh, they're talking about getting uh, UC Berkeley to have an exchange program with the University of Mississippi. Uh, and um, I'm getting in my email a lot of people who want to reach out to uh, across the partisan divide and find out what the deep story on the other side actually is. Um, so I guess the way I see it, we've got two things happening. On the one hand, global trends and offshoring and automation, the forgotten force, are leading to a pockets of distress in rural areas, Rust Belt areas, the South and uh, creating new inequalities. So that's the first thing that's happening. But the other thing that's happening is that the mechanisms through which we used to get to know each other and cross these divides have dissipated. We used to have a compulsory draft. So you would have a Berkeley professor uh, 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 doing tasks with a pipe fitter. You would have class crossover. You had race uh, crossover. We used to have a, a vital a labor union movement where, again, you would have crossover. And now it's down to 9%. So we're without those structural mechanisms through which rural and urban uh, might get to know each other. South and north might get to know each other. So I wonder if what you would think about this which is how about through schools, 
we create such a mechanism and have a giant exchange, internal domestic exchange program so that all juniors on coast were the guests of families for a month uh, that were in rural areas. And rural kids go to the coast, and you do something, some joint service project, let's say. And you get the south to go north and the north to go south. You train these kids in mediation skills. It's like a language, but very important one, in active listening and um, in how to handle what are um, hyper-symbolized kind of words. There's a skill that they could learn so that they could um, foster uh, some strips of common ground. And I think uh, that there is a way that people of very different general approaches to life can nonetheless agree on such things as reducing prison populations, um, uh, getting uh, clean energy, big buy on. There's something called the Green Tea Movement, <laughs> Tea Party people that are for for a, a, a green, going green, um, and getting money out of politics. All of these I I ran into um, in my field work. So, does that cheer you up? <laughs> no. Okay. Okay. So, uh, well, let us now open it out uh, for uh, any questions. Kathy. Um, okay, how about over here? Yeah. And stand, if you would. Yeah. I, I can stand up as easy. Me, as someone who was one of the initiators of the BDS movement here in the 80s, it was quite an adventure. And with all of these talks about Trump and what has gone wrong, and I listen to these people, it seems to me that something is missing in the American context, which you can find in discussions of hypernationalism in Europe, Western Europe, Eastern Europe, or in Israel. And that's what I call the pincers of the state. What's in here is all of the discussion of American internal affairs, like the white privilege conception or this kind of like Trump voter white privilege conception of social justice. Their, resent, their resentment of the postal system, their resentment of the tax system, right. the bureaucracy, etc. What's missing, which exists in other discussions of hypernationalism and race is the international relations aspect. Uh, for example, if you talk about a big right wing green feminist of color in Israel, they will talk about uh, the Arab world, the Palestine question. If you talk uh, to right wing feminists in Poland, uh, the Baltic, uh, France, uh, you will also hear, let's say, their fear of Putin or their of Putin, the world system, the refugee problem, and in that sense, it, the state creates like a pincer on these people's open nationalism. So I wonder if you did discuss foreign affairs with these people, if they discuss foreign affairs among themselves when they get together in the gas stations or other yeah. locales that you described, and how do they see the global south? How do they see U.S. involvement? And how do they see race and gender issues? In okay, those are a lot of questions. Uh, why don't, let's see. So that's uh, the question, basically. Okay, why don't you pick the one? The dialogue between the international sure. and the domestic. Sure, so, and I'd be fascinated to hear your answer to this, too. But I, in general, um, not a lot of discussion of international issues. I mean, U.S. public opinion is notorious for this, right? We just. Um, our lens is not often as global as in many other parts of the world. And um, 
it comes up certainly if there's something really prominent in news the day before. Um, but otherwise, there, the reference to global issues is, is very general along the lines of globalization in general, although people don't use that term. But they'll talk about you know the, the world economy or outsourcing or a sense of the, the flow of money across nations disadvantaging them. Um, but yes, as you are guessing, I mean it's, it's a different it's a different way of talking about your concerns. It's much less focused on global. Um, yes, but I'd be fascinated to hear what you heard. I'm pretty much the same, uh, kind of domestically um, centered. Um, of anxieties, even though the source of their anxieties is, is uh, you know, ultimately, I think, uh, stems from globalization and corporate strategies uh, for uh, cost reduction and, you know, going to cheap labor pools and uh, uh, in the third world. So, uh, except when it comes to Muslim things, people would say, oh, uh, Muslims, um, Sharia law, it's about to come. In Louisiana, there was 1.5% of Muslims in the whole state just weren't. Uh, and I'd say, well, do you know any Muslims? Well, yes, there are some Lebanese that run the gas stations. And what should happen if, if I couldn't get gas and get to work? <laughs> so this was... Um, uh, yeah, so that's how the outside came in. Yeah. Okay, over here. Yeah, you want to stand? Yeah. I appreciate both your efforts and understanding that regard teaching compassion. Keep it well as possible always, and just because the other side behaves badly in certain instances doesn't mean. But um, there's a certain element I feel in both your works that sort of has a fair and balanced quality to it. Because, well, they see us in this way, and we see them in that way, and neither of us see each other very clearly. And underneath all this, you could do the same kind of research, it seems to me, in 1928 Germany, and come to the same kind of conclusions about the people. There's a war going on. In some fundamental way, and it's really important to win it. Mm -hmm. And compassion is not going to do that. And that's, uh, okay, I have an answer to that, but you go first. <laughs> it, it's a. Um, I don't know if I have an answer to it, but it's something I think about a lot. Um, I, I guess my answer. Uh, is more personal than academic. And I choose personally to focus on compassion as much as I can, rather than um, demonizing, because I wouldn't be able to get out of bed otherwise. Um, I would like to answer that question, uh, too, if I might. Um, as uh, I've also, Frank Rich has uh, written a review uh, in uh, New York Magazine, came out in March, saying, well, he was pretty respectful about the book, but he said, it's this empathy. It's a fool's errand. You know, don't do it. Hold on to your anger, you know, and um, uh, forget empathy. That was basically his uh, argument. And while I, it would... He wouldn't like it, but I would say, I can empathize with that position. <laughs> Drive him nuts. <laughs> um, but I think it misdirects us as I see it. And again, speaking as a, a citizen here, I see uh, what I would like to see are three pillars of activism. And in order of importance, the first is to uh, defend um, 
democracy, uh, the system of checks and balances, the independence of the press and the judiciary. Um, and uh, that's the first pillar. You don't need to talk to people you don't agree with to do that. Pillar, and it's the first and most important thing. Pillar two is to uh, re, um, re-envision the democratic platform and engage in electoral politics. Again, you don't need to talk to people you don't agree with uh, for pillar two. But pillar three, and I think these one, two, three have to be coordinated with one another, like in a loyal opposition. But pillar three is to reach out to um, Trump voters. Mm -hmm. Now, who would you want to reach out to? Um, We know by some studies, six million, by other studies, eight million voters voted for, in 2012, for Barack Obama and switched in 2016 to Donald Trump. Well, would you be interested in talking to them uh, and searching for common ground and communicating um, things that you've uh, done in Pillar 2? Um, again, some one out of three people that voted for Donald Trump would have voted for Bernie Sanders uh, had he been the Democratic candidate. And uh, would you be interested in talking to them? I found a lot of friendliness toward Sanders, that not toward Hillary. But so, with those kinds of conversations and um, getting in touch with what the um, what the anxieties are, fears are, what would address those anxieties and fears, um, uh, you can feed pillar two and one. So in a coordinated way. You don't need to be the person that talks to people you don't agree with. But I think you do need to recognize the need for somebody to do that. That's my view. Thank you. Um, How about? Great question. It feels like a prelim question. Oh, sure. He, uh, the first part of the question was he would like to hear the gentleman's understanding of the war that we are in. And uh, he'd like to hear my understanding of democracy, what I think of as democracy in general. Well, as you can tell from my last slide, I, I wonder at times if it's an accurate label, right? Are we really in a democracy or not? But my understanding of a democracy is, in general, this the project of self-governance, of people governing each other. But more specifically, it's popular sovereignty combined with the protection of minority rights. And those two things, in my mind, are both essential to democracy. So it's not just um, self-governance, but also this idea that, yes, majority rule, balanced with an understanding that majority rule needs uh, to be in check and that to, to, to live in a place in which we are self-governing for the purposes of justice for all and a better life for all, that you need to have both. question. I mean, I would say we decide by balancing the concerns of the broader public good with the needs of people who might be damaged by that. Mm-hmm. Why don't you go on? You want to? Sure, in the back, please. Back. Sorry.
the uh, white male from Steve Bannon, uh, uh, of course off right, to uh, Professor Mark Lua of Columbia University, to uh, Professor to be uh, liberal. He blames my oppressed minorities, the so-called identity politics, for the loss. That he said, if you want to win elections, abandon identity politics, which I take to mean to abandon me. So the Tuesday election saw a great gain for Democrats, which I'm not one of. It saw a great gain for transgender people. It saw a great gain for Black Lives Matter, because there was a DA elected that represented Black Lives Matter. It saw a great gain. It had election victory for all the people that the alt-right and what I call the racist, white, single, pseudo-liberal, alt-left, or I'm sorry, alt-liberal, says are causing the problem. Thank you. So I, I think everybody could hear your questions, I think. Is there anyone who needs the question repeated? Questions? OK. So in the first part, what do people mean by, you know, populists or the, I mean, sorry, the people, what the, yeah. So in general, it's as you're alluding to, it's a pretty um, whitewash conception of the people, sort of defining the people as people who are typically not racial minorities or people who are um, cisgendered. I mean, the people as you know, traditionally gendered or cisgendered people, and typically male um, is often the way people, when people talk about who ought to be in power. But it varies from country to country. But in general, when we're talking about these so-called populist voters, it, as you are suggesting, yeah. Um, the elections on Tuesday, fascinating results. And I, uh, I think Virginia is probably the, the state I've had the chance to spend the most time of reflecting on since then. And um, I would say a big part of the explanation is the growing urban populations in Virginia. There was this great post today. There's um, on the Washington Post, there's this blog called The Monkey Cage, which was started by a bunch of political scientists several or more than several years ago now. That there's a really great post today that shows this graphic of Virginia and the vote returns and um, uh, kind of projected by population and how the population growth in Virginia has been primarily in the urban areas and they went predominantly uh, not for Gillespie, right? So um, I think that's part of the explanation is the way we're sorting by geography and the way, you know, the way um, the different groups that you remember mentioned that it being a win for certain population groups about how there's an increasing correlation between partisanship and the defense of those groups' rights. And also, this wasn't necessarily part of your question, but raising these arguments that are being most commonly attributed to Mark Lilla, really important to draw our attention to. I mean, these allegations that the that it's not a winning strategy and or it's not desirable to focus on so-called identity politics I say it's a good discussion to have in part because, I mean, especially just from where I sit as a scholar, all politics is identity politics. So, absolutely. So your first, your two parts of your question very aptly put together, right? Like this whole discussion of who the people are, that's identity politics. So. You know, I don't. I think the 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 support in the urban areas for the dem Democratic candidates. It, I mean, I think it's a similar story. But honestly, I I don't know. I, I I don't know for sure. I haven't had a chance to look at the data close enough to really be able to say. But I, I think so. And so, yeah, is that is that a response to Mark Lilla's call for less identity politics? Maybe so. Yeah, thank you for raising it. Um, how about on this one? Oh, sure, please. Yeah. On this issue of how to balance being a social justice warrior with being a bridge builder and somebody with empathy, I think it's really important to bear in mind that there are lots of different kinds of people on all sides yeah. of, these, of these questions. Yeah. And there's some of the survey research and poll results will demonstrate that. 
am skeptical of these pew poll results for a variety of methodological reasons that seem to show uh, uh, Trump supporters more open to uh, liberals than liberals are open to Trump supporters. It's good, good reason to have some questions. But the main point is there are all kinds of people on both sides. And for some of the people on Trump's side, yeah. we very definitely want to be social justice warriors. And for other kinds of people on the Trump side, we want to be open to bridge building and mutual understanding. Uh, there's a lot of ambivalence yes. on, on both sides. And the question is, how does that ambivalence get resolved? An awful lot of ambivalence has gotten resolved in favor of white supremacy, say, among people who aren't you know, pure racist, but who have some racist feelings, and most people our age have been raised in a society where that's pervasive. Uh, but they have been found themselves then in a media environment over the last 20, 30 years, which mobilized the white supremacist side of their ambivalence and resolved it in that direction. That doesn't mean it's permanent. That resolution is temporary. It's not permanent. It's situational. And it's up to us to change the situation so that among those who are reachable, the resolution of ambivalence goes the other way. Thank you. Great questions. It didn't happen often that I was taking part in or observing conversations where I felt this is so um, problematic for who I am in the world or this is so uh, cuts to the heart of, say, women's disempowerment, for example, that I, I can't I can't bear to be in the room or I'm I am complicit by virtue of listening, right? But there were um, moments that um, especially on reflection, especially on going over the transcripts, I do, um, you know, I, I ask myself, why didn't I say this? Or how did I um, let it go without saying something? And I, um, I think that happened to me more early on in the process than later on, because when in reflecting on that, I decided that there is there is more to gain from me listening and trying to understand from me following up and saying why do you think that than saying this is so whatever this is so horrible horrific um because the the times when i started to do something like that and they weren't like Grant, it wasn't a huge thing. It was more like someone saying something that I knew to be wrong and I found very problematic for that lack of knowledge to be out there. It, as soon as I started to go about down that path, you can imagine what happened and just how people shut down. And um, so, but I, you know, I'm white and it's, so it's, it's, 
it's probably different for me at times, like both in term, or should it be actually, you know, because even if they're not talking about my racial group, it's still my people as I like to understand it. So I don't know, my, yeah, it, it probably doesn't even make that much sense because it's probably the things that bother me the most, I think, is not when people were talking about white people, right? When they were talking about communities of color, um, particularly, I mean, it was Native Americans that would be most commonly brought up explicitly in these conversations that were, were kind of hard to, to sit through, you know? Um, but I could yeah, answer please. that. Please, yeah, and too. I, do, I don't want to forget your second question, but please, yeah, please. Um, in um, one time, I was uh, going to meetings of Republican women of Southwest Louisiana, and uh, there would be a, um, a table of eight people, uh, women, and one of the, the women uh, said, oh, I love Rush Limbaugh, you know, the conservative radio host. And I thought, holy Christ. And then I thought, <laughs> oh, I'd love to talk to you about that. And um, climbing my empathy wall, as I came to call it, and uh, with my political and moral alarm system off, uh, to be an active listener to um, <clears throat> their truth. So I had uh, sweet teas with this woman. She turned out to be uh, a, an amazing gospel singer in a large a Pentecostal megachurch. And she began uh, over sweet teas to explain to me that she loved Rush Limbaugh because he hated feminazis. And I thought, oh I hope she hasn't Googled me. <laughs> <laughs> and whoa, you know, um, second shift and so on. So, um, so then I, I knew that she really, here's what happened though. So I thought, well, she's dissing me and everything that I've tried to do, she distorts it. I asked her though, what is a feminazi? Well, it's a cold, hard person who just puts herself first and then also doesn't cook for her husband. So, okay. Um, so, uh, but in the course of things, she asked me, I know you don't agree with what I'm saying, because um, she talked about environmental wackos and so on. Um, uh, is it hard for you to hear what uh, I'm saying? And I said, actually, no, not at all. Um, because I have my alarm system off, and I'm here to find out about you and not to tell you about me, um, and you're doing me a favor. So did I feel personally put down? Well, I know that she was putting me down, you know, but um, my purpose there was to find out about her, so it went like that. I just want to briefly say something about your second question, and, you know, taking comfort in Hillary Clinton actually winning the popular vote. Um, and um, this isn't quite, this isn't an answer to quite the question that you asked, but um, I think part of what you're getting at is I'm, I'm here because our kind of collective as a nation, or at least in the chattering class as we might call ourselves, reaction to the election has been, look at what those white rural, or look at what those white working class voters just did in this past election, right? And that's not the only response that could have happened to this election. And um, so I, I, I don't have a great answer to your question, but I, I don't, I don't really take comfort in it. In fact, I, I mean, the, the, if I do take comfort, it's in, um, no, it's not comfort. It's actually, I'm, I'm just, I'm kind of disturbed by how much the response to the election has been, um, it's been great for me professionally, right? 
but I'm disturbed by how much the response has been. Let's look at what these white folks just did in this election. Thanks for the question. I think there's a ton. I mean, I'll I'll describe Madison and then you tell me, right? But it's uh it's a flagship public university that has this strong, proud history of activism and free speech. And it's a, a bastion of folks who think and talk a lot about the world around them and public affairs and where um, it's just the, the quality of life is kind of off the charts <laughs> in terms of greatness, right? From, from food to the cultural amenities. Um, and there's a a high value put on knowledge and information. And um, it's quite different than even other cities in the state, right? In the sense of like the focus on uh, dealing with problems in our brains as opposed to in our hearts <laughs> sometimes. So does that sound like Berkeley? <laughs> Oh, good. 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 Oh,